Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to the panel presentation portion of the of the CAP annual meeting. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Jobs again for the earlier keynote presentation. Uh, for those who missed my earlier introduction, I'm Dr. Troy Jansen. I'm the uh, deputy Re deputy registrar, chief of practice, and complaints director for the College of Alberta Psychologists. We're delighted uh, to be joined by colleagues from across Alberta for a panel presentation targeting our topic of the day, which is topics related to suicide and suicide prevention. Each panelist will briefly share their insights and experience. Uh, we're gonna encourage all participants to share their own observations and to ask questions of any of our speakers online today. You can submit any of your questions on our Q&A feature, which is found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll be monitoring the Q&A comments and trying to make sure we get to as many questions and answers as we can. We recognize it's a limited time and it may not be possible to get to everybody's questions, but we'll do the best we can. Um, just remember that when you input a question or comment, it can be visible to everyone. We ask that uh, you restrict your questions to the topic at hand if you have any specific personal messages or wish to have a question answered by the college, we invite you to contact us separately. If anyone has any uh, uh, questions as we go or technical difficulties, we are being uh, supported today by Matchbox and you can certainly put some comments in the chat room and they'll be able to assist you uh, in, in whatever way is needed. So with the uh, introduction of the a session out of the way, I'm going to introduce our first panelist, who is Mr. Jonathan Dubu. Jonathan is a fourth year doctoral candidate at the University of Alberta CPA accredited counseling psychology program. Welcome, Jonathan. His Shirk and Killam funded research examines how psychologists in Canada uh, practice, train, and experience suicide risk assessment and management, the results of which has informed 15 plus suicide, pre uh, suicide prevention guest lectures and workshops and he has sat on suicide prevention boards at the university, municipal and provincial level, and collaborated with health authorities to promote better suicide prevention practices. By the 2022 CAP professional development event, he will also have completed his residency at the Edmonton Clinical Psychology Consortium, leaving only one more paper before graduating. Outside of academics, Jonathan loves tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, which I used to play when I was younger as well, so as it turns out, uh, pretending to be an amateur photographer and using too many exclamation marks at emails. <laughs> All right, that, so with no further ado, I'll invite you to unmute yourself, Jonathan, and take the floor for the next 15 minutes. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Jensen. Um, I, it, it, not wrong. I... If you do send me an email, I will give you an inhuman amount of exclamation marks. That's a that's a promise I'm always willing to keep. Uh, and that's the kind of energy that I want to take into this talk today, which is a bit of a call to action. It's a spicy topic, and I think it deserves a spicy title. Um, that we I'm I'm asking for us to do this entire suicide risk assessment and management thing a little different, which I think uh, leapfrogs very well from uh, Dr. Job's fantastic presentation. And in order to tell you a bit more about this, uh, I want to uh, draw us back a little bit, and just just a little bit uh, from a time where I looked like this. This was about 11 odd years ago when I first learned how to do my first suicide risk assessment. Uh, and since then, uh, things have changed. Uh, we now know, as Dr. Jobs has mentioned, that risk factors contribute little to suicide prediction and that our risk levels, uh, their level of differentiation, you know, high, medium, low, is often wrong. Uh, that our hospitalization uh, actually may be causing some harms, harms that we hadn't considered previously that universal screening may be offering poor clinical value in that they are missing real dangers and are too sensitive. That our suicide theory, as Dr. Jobes also went through, uh, is uh, changing. It's evolved in the last little while. That's focused a lot more on prevention than it is prediction. Uh, and I think the piece that's uh, perhaps more striking and arguably also much more recent that our structured assessments may actually be damaging the therapeutic alliance, which is our you know, premium clinical tool by which we uh, create change in our clients. Uh, so it, it is parsimonious to suggest that a lot has changed in the world of suicide risk assessment and management. 
And I set about on the last six year journey to ask the simple yet increasingly complex question, have we? This question also mentioned or could also look like how do psychologists assess suicide? Um, by and large, I started with a like a, a top or a bottom up approach, did some in-depth interviews with psychologists in Canada. After those interviews or with the results of those interviews, I developed a, a Canada wide survey I gave to psychologists across Canada. I followed up with a handful of folks who are representative of that survey sample, uh, and then I put it all together in a mixed method analysis to answer my question, what are we what are we doing when it comes to suicide risk assessment and management? That first piece is my published master's thesis. This last piece is my dissertation. Uh, it is not published. It is not done yet. I'm working on it. Um, and this is what I'm going to be focusing on in this talk. So when I tried to uh, separate out what suicide risk assessment uh, could look like in psychology, or at least the questions I could ask, uh, I looked at three different things. I looked at practices, training, and experiences. So practices wise, there's only been a handful of folks who have done this work, and those folks typically use checklists. They say, okay, here's here's a bunch of boxes. What do you do when somebody brings up suicide? Um, I wanted something a little bit more natural. So I asked something that is very typical that we would find in our practice. Client says they want to die by suicide, step by step. What do you do? Paint me a picture. Draw it out for me. Take all the time you need. This is the survey. At its core, this is the big piece of it. And I got some fantastic responses. I got these nice little narratives. They tell me, tell me about like, you know, like I let's see if it's active or passive thoughts. I got some fantastic little bullet points about you know, what they assess. I got people who spent their entire day writing me an excellent response. It's not done. An excellent response um, that is just so rich in data. So uh, myself and my co-investigator, which is actually one of the presenters in this talk, it's uh, it's Emily Mack. Uh, we coded this for you know what kind of suicide risk assessments were they doing, uh, what did they mention, and we largely found that about seventy six percent, about three quarters of us, are doing these risk assessments that have a specific order, specific questions, but they don't follow a specific scale or protocol. They just kind of are what we've been doing. Uh, but they will do this one over and over again compared to the standardized folks, which say, I do a Columbia. And the fluid folks that say, I ask about thoughts, and then I kind of let the client take the lead. I, I kind of give them the chance to tell me uh, like what's next, or I use their answer in that their answer determines my next question. That by and large, these assessments are focused on gathering information, um, and that a smaller portion are using these uh, these interventions or these sorry these assessments to have more of a therapeutic nature to it. Um, I'll allude to this earlier, but this is what uh, Dr. Jobs was talking about when he mentioned therapeutic assessment. Uh, two thirds of us are doing some safety planning or stabilization planning. Um, 65 are doing are still differentiating risk levels. You might recall from earlier I mentioned that this may now be contraindicated or perhaps at least less indicated. Uh, despite our understanding that suicide is quite psychosocial, as Dr. Job was mentioning, like what, what drives us to suicide, most of us uh, aren't asking about these drivers. <sighs> and one person out of the entire sample assessed for any level of cultural or spiritual factor. And there's a whole talk that could be done just on that data point. That is not this talk. Uh, when it comes to universal screening, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a good chunk of us, a, a large majority, are asking about suicide in the first session, be it intake uh, or the first like phone call, some, something to the effect of they, they do some level of uh, screening at the beginning. Um, and about 40% at any given moment in that narrative mentioned a humanistic or therapeutic skill. Said differently, 60% of, uh, of the sample only exclusively do assessment in this time, only exclusively ask questions. And the, the bar to meet this check mark was quite low. It could be like, oh, I did a little validation. I uh, you know, mentioned, you know, it's it can be quite painful to you know, have thoughts of suicide chronically, something, anything like that. And my goodness, there's so much more. Uh, uh, this is my shameless plug that if uh, you are interested in doing this kind of research, you have a student who's interested in doing this kind of research, and you're like, we don't have data. I do. Please come chat with me. Um, all right. Training-wise, I asked, where did you do it? 
And I love this because it's so on the nose. Uh, most of the participants, most of the psychologists are doing continuing education training when it comes to suicide risk assessment. Um, it's on the nose because it's this. This is continuing ed fundamentally, right? This is professional development, followed by some self-directed training, which is largely readings, and then internship is third. Uh, I followed up with like, all right, well, out of the ones you endorsed, out of all of these potential, or all these trainings that you said you're doing, which one mattered? Which one was the most influential? Uh, continuing ed, still at the top, followed by internship, followed by Crisis center. Uh, so the picture I'm sure I showed you earlier about, you know, who I was 11 years ago at the crisis center, had I not done this research, it probably would have been the most influential training for a good chunk of my academic training. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that it ranks third. I asked why it was influential, what made it good. Uh, most folks said experiential. And this is also, a, I, I love this follow-up from Dr. Jobs because he mentioned like role plays, observations, like you're, you're doing the thing. You're not just talking about it. That didactic training doesn't work. It's actually doing and like trying to figure out how you do this suicide risk assessment stuff. And that it was practicable. They knew exactly what to do, how to do it, why to do it. They had their form. Uh, it, it made sense and they could follow that script quite well. Um, I then asked, when did this happen? When did you do this influential training? And most folks said, uh, you know, it was extracurricular during graduate school or it was afterwards. Now, I think it's probably a popular opinion, at least it's my opinion, so I'm going to assume it's popular, uh, that suicide risk assessment and management should be a core competency for psychologists. It's a little jarring that our most influential training is coming outside of the academy. Uh, that said, I did want to ask, how was it? Specifically, your graduate level suicide risk assessment training, was it good? Did it prepare you? 60-40 uh, said, yes, uh, it did. Uh, but notice the amount of strongly disagrees, which uh, I think comes uh, a little bit more apparent here when I ask, uh, did you receive sufficient training prior to seeing your first suicidal client? Um, I'll paint a little picture. If I'm a, if I'm a client, I'm going to a student clinic, uh, I don't want it to be a coin flip as to whether or not the person in front of me is going to be more fearful of the suicide risk assessment process than I am fearful of my suicidality. Um, I think it's important to consider that we should be doing perhaps a bit more prior to this first interaction. This first interaction can be a huge deal for a lot of folks. Experiences wise, um, I, I, I know I've mentioned this already, but like love Dr. Job's presentation because he mentioned Paul Meal. And uh, I think this would have Paul Meal uh, rolling in his grave and that a good chunk of psychologists are relying on that kind of clinical gut, that clinical intuition to determine suicide risk. A similar proportion are saying, yeah, they trust the scales and measures. We know actuarial measures are more predictive. The uh, important thing to notice about these two questions is that we're still fundamentally trying to determine risk level. I asked about stress. Yeah, this process in the literature is one of the most stressful things that psychologists do. By and large, asking about it, not that stressful for psychologists. But that stress goes up when we do a detailed suicide risk assessment, in part because psychologists believe that it's our professional responsibility to prevent suicide and that this risk assessment process often is perceived to help protect us from legal liability. There's a whole other talk in this one too, uh, and I'll point to a resource that will we'll do any talk I could give way more justice. Okay, that's the first half of my dissertation, and that like we're scratching the surface of it. I'm not going to talk a lot about the second half because that's uh, a whole bunch. What I need to tell you is I did some follow-up qualitative interviews. We did a top-down and bottom-up analysis, both myself and Emily. Uh, we iteratively reviewed it. We did some synthesized member checks. We have these beautifully rich tables. I'm not showing you any of those. I want to show you what happens when we combine it with the survey data that I just presented to you. Looks something like this. Practices, training, experiences. Those are my research questions. We have the quantitative findings, the qualitative themes, and these meaty chunks of integrated conclusions. So if you have me in an elevator and you're like, Jonathan, what have you been thinking about for the last six years? You have 45 seconds to tell me about it. Um, I'm so prepared for that. Uh, he, here it is. Uh, we are doing structured, unstandardized suicide risk assessments that are largely focused on information. We are influenced primarily by our past supervisors. There's a little generational effect where we are told uh, by our supervisors, like this is the suicide risk assessment that we're doing. Uh, 
this is the one that you're going to be doing. We see hospitalization as a last resort, knowing it harms the therapeutic alliance. We're often only ready for suicide risk assessment practice after graduate training. Uh, that the readiness often comes from just doing it over and over and over again. And it comes from supervisors giving us a proverbial pat on the head of, yes, that's exactly what I would do if I were doing a suicide risk assessment. Uh, and my goodness, the graduate training is insufficient. A lot of folks are, especially in the interviews, uh, exclaim that. Um, that suicide is psychosocial, but we don't often ask about the psychosocial nature of it. We don't ask much about the drivers. That the stress that we have is quite proportional to the perceived risk level. So again, we can't measure, we're not good predictors of this risk level, but we do have a, uh, a sense that if it is high, if we think it's high, our stress is high. And that we're using these suicide risk assessments for ethical legal compliance. I'm breaking it down. This is the discussion section of, uh, of, the, of the paper of my talk. By and large, we know suicide risk assessments do not predict risk. We're still predicting risk. And a good chunk of us don't know that we can't. We know that suicide risk assessments aren't intrinsically helpful to clients. And we're not really practicing client-centered suicide risk assessments. We know that risk assessments broadly are stressful for psychologists and clinicians. And although we are not as stressed as I first hypothesized, we're still getting stressed the more involved we get in them. And that's the title of my talk. We must and can do things differently because it's hard for us. It's hard for clients. No one's having a good time. Um, and the benefit is that we can do something different. And importantly, uh, you don't have to do in this process alone. Clearly, like this, this uh, not only my talk, but this entire panel presentation, Dr. Jobs's talk is going to help with this process. Also, please send me an email, make my last six years worth my time. Um, practices wise. My recommendations is what just happened. It's CAMS. I think ideation, as Dr. Jobs has mentioned, is massive. And that's largely what we're going to be encountering in a clinical practice. So please, I encourage you to uh, look more into this training. It's phenomenal. And I'd also uh, like to like mention therapeutic assessment. As Dr. Jobs mentioned, the philosophy of doing an assessment with a therapeutic intent, that the client is part of it, that if we do a suicide risk assessment, they also have an understanding of what that means for them. Training-wise, it's got to be experiential. It's got to be graduate. It's got to be earlier. And the person to go to for this is Dr. Kramer. Uh, this is the core competency model. It's a fantastic bullet-pointed method of doing the suicide risk assessment training. I can't recommend it enough. And if you're a supervisor, know that the suicide risk assessment strategies that you're using are the ones your students are going to be using, or supervisees, sorry. So I encourage you to do the training and also maybe I'll have a workshop at some point, but before the workshop, I need to finish my dissertation and sleep um, in no particular order. Experiences, suicide comes with such a, uh, a heaviness. Uh, I encourage you to do some self-reflection in that uh, we have, uh, well, I'm out of time, aren't I, Dr. Jansen? Um, uh, I've got added the unfortunate chat. I can't see the chat. Um, so attitudes towards suicide, I recommend it. The cap monitor from Dr. Derek Trescott in the spring is fantastic. Look, super simple. Uh, we can help do our clients better. It's by doing what you're already good at. Uh, go do that thing. Please send me an email about it. My goodness, my apologies for this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Sorry to rush you at the end there. Uh, we just want to make sure we're leaving time for all our panelists. And that, that was really useful and helpful information. We'll have some questions for you as part of the panel at the end. I'd like to now welcome uh, Dr. Rachel King uh, to, to be our next panelist. And she is a registered psychologist who completed her doctoral degree at the University of Alberta in 2019. I had the pleasure of working with Dr. King uh, during her studies at the U of A because I was there during that time and it was a treat to work with her there. And she won the PAA Dissertation of the Year Award, which I didn't know until I read this. So that was, congratulations on that. Rachel has taught as a sessional lecturer at both U of A and at the Concordia University of, of Edmonton and has published research in the areas of hope and resilience. Um, uh, she completed her residency with the Edmonton Consortium in 2018, and she began her clinical career at the Gray Nuns Community Hospital, where she worked in the outpatient DBT program for several years. She's currently in private practice at Edgar Psychological and is involved in launching a comprehensive treatment program through the DBT Care Center. She has a clinical interest in treatment of emotional dysregulation and borderline personality disorder. And Rachel lives near the River Valley in Edmonton with her husband, son, and golden retriever. Welcome, Rachel, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Jansen. And thank you to CAP for hosting and highlighting this important topic. 
As Tori mentioned, uh, I'm a registered psychologist in private practice at Edgar Psychological's DBT Care Center. And I wanna to talk today about effective treatment for individuals who are suicidal. As Dr. Jobes mentioned, DBT or dialectical behavior therapy was developed by Marsha Linehan in the 1980s. And she initially developed the treatment for women who were highly suicidal, regardless of diagnosis. It has since become known as the BPD or Borderline Personality Disorder Treatment, but its application seems to be broad for individuals of any diagnosis who are chronically suicidal or at high risk of suicide. So who are the people who struggle with chronic suicidality? Linehan underlined a general difficulty of emotion dysregulation. That is the inability to flexibly respond to and manage emotions. So how does this come to be? We look at the biosocial model. Biologically, some of us are simply born more sensitive to emotions. This isn't inherently a good or bad thing. A lot of psychologists tend to be emotionally sensitive people. When you're emotionally sensitive, it simply means that you feel your emotions more intensely, that emotions are more easily set off with a lower threshold, and that it takes longer to return to baseline or calm down after an emotional experience. So in addition to this biological sensitivity, this sensitive young person is exposed during development to an environment that is invalidating of emotional experiences or expression. To be clear, an invalidating environment is not the same thing necessarily as an unloving environment. It's simply an environment that communicates in one way or another, verbally or non-verbally, that the person's emotions are unacceptable or wrong or overwhelming to other people in their lives and that they need to control them, but it doesn't teach them how. So it's this transaction between sensitivity and invalidation over time that results in an emotion regulation skills deficit paired with increasingly intensely painful emotional experiences. So Linehan describes this as the emotional equivalent of walking around the world as a third degree burn victim. Even the smallest touch can be excruciating. So the more that I've worked with this population, the more that I've begun to see emotion regulation as a spectrum, which can encompass a number of diagnoses. So of course, BPD um, is associated with extreme emotion dysregulation and the symptoms of BPD, such as impulsivity, conflictual relationships, self-harm and identity difficulties are common responses to this mix of overwhelming emotions and lack of skills. In addition, folks struggling with treatment resistant depression often have really high levels of dysregulation as well, but instead of the externalizing symptoms that we see in BPD, they are more often shut down and disconnected from emotions, but with the same internal misery and suffering. We also see emotion dysregulation in eating disorders and substance use disorders. In both cases, symptoms often are driven by a desire to be able to shift states or avoid emotional suffering. In study after study, when emotion dysregulation is high, regardless of symptom presentation, an individual is more likely to be suicidal. Because emotions are an unavoidable part of human life, when they are painful, life itself feels painful. Therefore, I think we need to see suicidality not as a symptom on a list, but as a natural result of living with unremitting suffering. It's really an attempt of what Stephen Hayes would call our problem solving minds to solve the problem of suffering. I wanna speak briefly about hope. Rana Jevney, who was a researcher at Hope Study Central at the U of A, gave what I believe to be the best definition of hope. Hope is the capacity to imagine a future in which we wish to participate. Here is where evidence-based and effective treatment makes a real difference. We can provide people with hope that life can be different, that emotions might not always be so painful and actually help them to build a life worth participating in. We know DBT works for folks who struggle to regulate their emotions. As Dr. Job said, it's one of the most researched treatments. I said over 30 randomized control trials because I didn't want to count them, but he says 44. Uh, DBT has been shown to be effective for all the diagnoses I mentioned 
earlier, um, as well as bipolar disorder, treatment resistant anxiety, adolescents who are suicidal and chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. We know DBT reduces suicide attempts, non-suicidal self-injury or self-harm, depression, hopelessness, substance dependence, impulsivity, and anger outbursts. And it doesn't just keep people alive in misery, it also helps give them lives worth living. So we see increases in hope, huge increases in subjective quality of life, capacity for emotion regulation, and self-esteem. We can even see treatment effects on fMRIs. So after comprehensive DBT, we see decreased amygdala hyperactivity and enhanced frontal limbic connectivity. As many of you will already know, um, DBT is a full treatment. It is not just a therapeutic orientation. To be considered comprehensive, treatment must fulfill five functions. So first, um, Weekly individual therapy generally fulfills the function of maintaining client motivation, keeping the client coming back through offering a new type of relationship with a balance of validation and firm push for change. Weekly group therapy typically fulfills the function of skills training. So we address the underlying skills deficit. Um, there's four main modules, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, emotion regulation, and mindfulness skills. And these are used to replace ineffective or harmful behaviors and provide tools for managing emotions in new ways. Third, phone coaching fulfills the function of generalizing skills to the natural environment so that clients can be coached on using skills, not just in the therapy session, but where they need them most in their own lives. A consultation team fulfills the function of motivating and improving the skills of therapists so that we can remain engaged and effective in working with people with complex difficulties. Finally, there's the function of ensuring structure in the overall treatment process, which is fulfilled by having a pre-treatment process, asking clients to commit to a schedule of therapy, and providing treatment hierarchy, diary cards, behavior chain analyses, these tools so that complex problems can be systematically and effectively addressed, rather than playing what I call therapeutic whack-a-mole with the, the problem of the week or the crisis of the week. So these five components essentially work together to produce treatment outcomes, plus time. Six months seems to be the sweet, pot, sweet spot for efficiency plus effectiveness. Um, however, adolescents seem to need a little bit longer. So at its heart, DBT works to systematically and supportively expose clients to their emotional experiences without avoidance, dissociation, impulsive behavior, or numbing. It teaches them to have a new relationship with their emotions and essentially gives them the tools to self-regulate they didn't learn in development. So we know what works. However, very few clients in Alberta have access to the treatment that works. The program at the Grey Nuns where I was trained closed Christmas 2020 with over 400 folks active on the wait list. This was despite very strong program evaluation data that showed that patients got better and stayed better, even continuing to make gains two years after treatment end. The Royal Alex last I checked had a seven year wait list and the Sheldon Chumier in Calgary about a year long. There are a couple of comprehensive private programs in Edmonton and a couple in Calgary that have really great treatment outcomes, but there's a definite lack of access in rural Alberta. And while more and more therapists identify DBT as an area of competence, very few of them are offering comprehensive treatment. From what I've seen, there appear to be two big barriers to increasing availability of DBT in private practice and public health. It's either oversimplified and seen as a worksheet therapy and therefore offered with very little adherence to the functions of treatment or the underlying philosophy so that it's not effective and therefore not reinforcing for the clinician or for the client. Or it's thought to be so complex that it's not motivating for therapists or systems to even try to offer it. I wanna argue it's possible to implement DBT effectively in both public health and private practice settings. And today I wanna to offer a few practical suggestions. First, if you're interested in doing this kind of work, seek training. It is awesome that there's so much interest and excitement. 
there's a ton of need. I would encourage you to learn as much as you can under whatever practical constraints you have. So get advanced training in the treatment, seek supervision where needed, learn the theory of dialectics and understand its clinical application. If anyone asks me, I always say, read Marsha's book and then read it again. Um, secondly, join a team or start a team. You might not be able to offer a comprehensive program within your own practice, but join a team of other similar minded practitioners so that you can have support in doing this important work well. PsychWire offers intensive training for teams as well as individual practitioners where you're actually set up with a team of other DBT therapists and both have a year of built-in consultation with a DBT expert to help you establish comprehensive treatment in your setting. My own team has just gone through the training and it's excellent. Third, work towards adherence. So work towards fidelity and fulfilling all of the functions of treatment. Be creative where you need to be about fulfilling those treatment functions. The other thing I'd encourage therapists to do is really be honest about what you're offering and what you're not offering to clients. Don't tell clients you're offering DBT if you're not actually offering the treatment. This is about hope maintenance. If clients think that they've had DBT and it hasn't worked, that can be a big threat to hope. Finally, use program evaluation. So as much as you can, use program evaluation and outcome monitoring, gather data. This is important in the small scale and the bigger picture. In the small scale, we wanna use this data to inform treatment. Perhaps a client is improving in some ways and not others. Perhaps they need a longer or shorter course of therapy. So using diary cards to track treatment targets and open access measures like the DERS or difficulties in emotion regulation scale can be a really helpful way of identifying issues and problem solving as you go through treatment with an individual. We can also use program evaluation to look at the bigger picture and ensure we're providing effective treatment. Um, this can also provide hope for clients or future clients that, that treatment can be effective for them. In terms of the public system, we need to advocate for more availability of comprehensive treatment. My previous mentor uh, and super, well, still mentor, I'd say, and supervisor, Dr. Stephanie Mitchell, um, analyzed years worth of data for individuals with repeat or lengthy hospital admissions to the gray nuns. What she found was that while depression was the most common presenting problem for these lengthy and multiple admissions, BPD was the second and the most common access to. So based on this data, she found at the DBT uh, center at the nuns, um, for her psychology team to be as effective as possible at reducing the strain on the mental health care system. Because we are function as stewards of resources and public care, I do think we need to take this utilitarian approach and try to help the most people who are suffering the most as effectively as we can, especially in public health settings, implementing a stepped care model can be a really effective way of helping as many folks as possible. Questions are really rightly asked about costs. So I had several meetings with management where the message was, can you do what you're doing and get these same treatment outcomes, but like with less? Maybe just post videos online for people to watch. Uh, the truth is this is a complex treatment designed to solve complex problems. And yes, it costs more than treatment as usual. Thankfully, the research has been done on cost effectiveness. In the UK and Australia, studies find that providing comprehensive DBT pays for itself within two years in reductions in ER visits and inpatient stays alone. This is to say nothing about reduction in suffering or improvement in quality of life and ability to work or contribute meaningfully to one's community. So yes, providing comprehensive DBT in a timely way to those who need it is good public policy. And this is the story we need to be telling to policymakers. And the question should not be, does this treatment save us money? The question should be, does this treatment save lives? And it does. So my request to you all today is just to consider what you can do in your position, whether as a clinician or decision maker, to push for greater access to effective treatment for those who need it and who are living and suffering. 
one of our ethical obligations is to engage in social justice tasks when those tasks are relevant to bettering the lives of the individuals and communities that we serve. As a profession, we need to advocate to ensure that individuals who are suicidal get timely access to appropriate treatment, regardless of the circumstances. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. King, for that great presentation. Really appreciated hearing about that. And, and uh, you know, I think that, that, that we'll have some questions for you uh, as, and the other panelists at the, at the end. I just want to now turn to introduce uh, Emily Mack. Uh, Emily Mack is a provisionally registered psychologist with CAP and is currently completing her PhD in counseling psychology at the University of Alberta. Uh, her research focuses on psychological ethics, suicide and media, and she has presented and published on issues related to suicide, suicide contagion and media for the past four years and has worked with community organizations to develop programs related to suicide prevention and grief. Her current research centers on the intersection between youth Caring Adults, Suicide Contagion, and Fictional Media. Emily's clinical, focus, uh, Emily's clinical focus includes women's issues, trauma intervention, and community mental health. Uh, she's also a recipient of the National Vanier Graduate Scholarship. Congratulations on that. Welcome, Emily, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Let me, sorry, I'm just uh, going to be sharing my screen in a manner that is effective for everyone. Okay. Uh, okay. Can we see this okay? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me today. It is uh, my pleasure to be here and to talk to you about um, some of the research that I am doing on suicide contagion and media. Uh, like Dr. Jansen said, my name is Emily Mack. I'm a, a provisional psychologist. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Alberta, uh, hopefully soon to be doctoral candidate. <laughs> my candidacy exam is in less than three weeks, so thank you for indulging me in, in practicing for that today. <laughs> um, so without further ado, I'd just like to, to talk a little bit about uh, yeah, suicide contagion in media. So uh, question, what is suicide contagion. Um, suicide contagion is the market increase in suicides following the exposure to another suicide. So perhaps the most um, common example of this, maybe the, the example that people may be most familiar with is in the case of celebrity suicides. So for example, the, the death of Kurt Cobain um, caused a, an international increase in suicides in the months following his death. And this is an example of what we may consider suicide contagion. How does contagion happen, you ask? Um, suicide contagion uh, happens through what we call clustering. And um, these types of clusters that I'm gonna be talking about have been uh, theorized by people smarter than I who have been doing this for a lot longer, but I'm here to just share this information with you today. So firstly, we have point clustering um, or spatiotemporal clusters. And this is when there is an increased number of suicides within both a geographical location as well as uh, a time frame. Uh, so for example, in one singular community, if there's an increase in suicides over uh, a certain number of time, that would be considered a point cluster. Uh, mass clusters are a greater than expected number of suicides within a specific time period, but not necessarily one geographical location. So um, this is an example of um, mass clustering, or an example of mass clustering would be um, the, the individuals who are perhaps in the public um, eye and die by suicide, and it causes uh, kind of a mass increase in suicides. And then finally, we have echo clustering, um, which is suicide, that occurs in the same location as a previous suicide, but sometime later. Uh, so point clusters can uh, develop into echo clusters um, as well. Why does suicide contagion happen? Um, there are a number of different uh, takes and processes by which we've theorized about why this may happen. Uh, the first one that I have here is transmission. And this is simply the idea that information that we are transmitting to 
uh, one another through uh, personal communication, mass communication, such as through the media um, or otherwise may cause individuals to, um, to be more vulnerable to suicide simply through suggestion. And uh, this was first theorized by Phillips in the 70s. Um, and it is also called the Werther effect. And, and um, that is kind of, I would say, the, the first and most generalized theory of how suicide contagion occurs. Uh, the second is through imitation. Um, and this, again, may be through information that is being provided specifically about things such as memes or about um, why and, and where, et cetera, and can also, again, be projected through the media. The third type of process by which contagion may occur is context. So this has less to do with specific exposure to suicide and more about the contextual acceptability of suicide for individuals. So for example, in certain cultural and um, even just specific, um, I, sorry, what I'm trying to say is like cultural meaning, you know, it, it may be within one community, it may be within uh, a broader culture as well. There are varying levels of acceptability for suicide and different situations by which suicide may be acceptable. So for example, there are instances and cultures where honor suicides are highly acceptable or uh, community uh, instances where suicide is considered to be um, beneficial for the greater good. And these contexts may also be, um, be considered when we're talking about suicide contagion. And then finally, we have uh, contagion through affiliation. And this is a more specific instance than suicide through imitation. And it's when there is a deep kind of connection between the individual who died by suicide and oneself that may increase the risk of suicide, specifically in vulnerable individuals. So for example, you know, this can be through someone that an individual may know or, an individ or someone who an individual may not know. Um, so in this example, if you have a high affiliation, if you really connect with someone on a number of, of areas outside of suicide risk. So for example, uh, maybe um, you're very close because you have the same career. Um, you're, you're just close because you're friends. You have a lot of similar um, personality traits. Even individuals who um, really admire other individuals such as public figures and really identify with that person. Um, contagion through affiliation can occur when those people and their lives and, and then, you know, you kind of internalize that for yourself as well. So how does this apply to media? Well, um, you may have heard, you may have not heard, but media can influence the rate at which suicide contagion occurs. There have been various and, and many studies done on specifically news media. So um, newspapers, magazines, um, um, uh, TV news and uh, online news sources. And the way in which suicide is reported through the media can impact the rate at which suicide contagion occurs. So for this reason, there have been several guidelines which have been outlined by various organizations, both on the national level and on the international level. So we have guidelines from places like the uh, CASP, the Canadian Association for Suicide Prevention, as well as places like the World Health Organization about how um, individuals in the media can mitigate the risk of suicide contagion um, in their practices of reporting. And, you know, I won't go over every single guideline uh, here. You know, these are all links for you. So you are able to, to click on them uh, when they're provided to you, thankfully. Um, but I will highlight a couple of uh, important ones. Uh, specifically, they recommend that you news media does not uh, specify the means in which uh, an individual dies by suicide. Um, you are not to kind of glamorize and have flashy um, headlines that, uh, again, kind of sensationalize the, the incident. Um, there's also recommendations 
to consider the, the mental health of those media professionals as they're reporting on suicide, um, make it clear about how to access mental health uh, support uh, when you are, again, talking about uh, the case of a suicide. So again, there's there have been well-documented uh, guidelines and support for how to mitigate this uh, risk of contagion through news media. However, we also have an issue with fictional media. And um, I'm sure that many of you have uh, heard about the show 13 Reasons Why. Um, for those of you who haven't, 13 Reasons Why is a television show that was released first by Netflix in 2017. The plot of the show is about a teenage girl who takes her own life and it then leaves behind 13 uh, tapes uh, outlining why she decided to kill herself and who was ultimately responsible um, in her eyes for her wanting to make this decision. Um, her friend, who's also depicted in this photo, is then given the task to go and listen to these tapes and find the people who she um, believes caused her to um, get to this point where she's she made the decision to end her own life. Um, there are so many things that I could say about this show and I have, um, again, shameless plug, I have written a review that was published in 2020 about um, the, the specific effects of the show on, on mental health uh, in, in youth and, and others, if you wanna check that out. Um, but uh, I don't have a lot of time. So, so what I'll say is that there has been a lot of literature about the effects of this show on youth mental health as well as suicide rates, hospitalizations, um, and just, you know, really overall well-being. Um, and, and, and again, it's, it's fascinating just the, the sheer amount of information we have on this show already because uh, it was only released five years ago and we already have, you know, a meta-analysis meta done that was um, published last year outlining that the show did indeed um, have negative effects on mental health as well as on suicide rates in North American youth. Um, so here are a couple of slides. Just this this is really just a a, a hand picking of of um, articles and and literature that that I have personally read. But there's a lot more out there, um, fortunately or unfortunately, um, for you to kind of use and and check out for yourself as well. So ultimately the question is, um, what are we going to do with this information? Um, and how it is, is this relevant at all to, to what I'm hoping to do uh, with my research? So um, my dissertation that I'm gonna be working on this year is entitled Fictional Stories with Real Consequences, a study of youth media and suicide. And, and what I'm hoping to do through this is to get the perspective of youth as well as supportive adults. So people who are, are trying to support teens um, through uh, teen years, um, which is a, a battle in and of itself um, and, and get their perspectives on, you know, whether they have any concerns about suicide in, in fictional media, whether they have seen shows or, or movies that have suicide within them, whether they believe that it affects their mental health or not. Um, and how they talk to each other about, about those things. So a little bit of uh, specific and um, gen specific and yet generalized uh, flow of what my research is going to look like. Um, I'm doing a mixed methods study. So the first uh, quantitative stream, phase one, as I like to call it, um, is going to be using data mining and topic analysis from social media. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know, data mining is when you take information that is already out there on the web. Um, there are some really powerful computer programs made by people who are, again, smarter than me. <laughs> and you're able to then take that textual information, quantitatively analyze it, and determine what the main topics um, that are expressed within that text uh, are. So we're going to be taking things from Reddit, 
and Twitter and likely other uh, sources from the web and just determine what the main topics covered by the four seasons of 13 Reasons Why were, uh, what they're generally talking about in terms of mental health and suicide, and then also to determine what the general sentiment around the show was from the public. So for example, uh, we have, uh, sorry, I'm just noticing we're at 12 minutes. Um, so for example, did people think that it was good? Did the people think it was bad? Did they think it was helpful, not helpful? Did they think that it um, was uh, useful or should we should have more of this? We should have less of this, that kind of thing. And then once we kind of get that information, we're going to use it to develop focus group questions um, so that we can have focus groups with youth and these supportive adults. Um, and, and that again, could look like parents, um, mentors of other kinds, sports coaches, teachers, um, spiritual leaders, etc. cetera. Um, we're going to develop these focus group questions based on the topics we find in the first phase and then ask them questions, as I kind of mentioned earlier, about exploration of suicide in media and exploration around how they talk to each other about suicide, as well as how teens may talk to their peers about suicide as well, um, and specifically about suicide as it's portrayed in TV and movies. And then of course, in the third phase, we're hoping to integrate those results to come to some nuanced conclusions um, as well. So of course, this is a little bit, uh, it's a little theoretical, it's a little bit research-based. Um, I'm talking about uh, some pieces that relate to psychoeducation. So what are the implications as clinicians? Um, ultimately, I would really just encourage you to educate yourself. Um, there's a great video by Dr. Madeline Gould, who is an expert on, on suicide contagion and youth. She is has been doing this for so many years and is just, um, I find to be a very compelling speaker, uh, very helpful. So uh, there's a link to this, this video here. Check out for yourself these guidelines for news and media. Um, on slide six, I have there for you. Uh, there's even one, a uh, set of guidelines that is specifically now developed for depictions or like fictional portrayals of suicide, which is really helpful because it's something we haven't had before. So I would encourage you to just check that out. Um, and then prepare to support others. You know, as psychologists, we are the best prepared to support our community and to talk to people about issues such as this. So if you work in a school, if you work in a tight knit community, if you work for a nonprofit, um, you may very well encounter a situation where someone in your community dies by suicide and you know the community you know is shaken because of that and the risk for for contagion is present so um, inform yourself about uh, postvention resources again there's a link here to the suicide prevention resource center and um, yeah just give yourself the opportunity to uh, seek that education and and put those resources in your tool belt so that you're able to support um, your clients and and your community as well. Um, Perfect. Thanks, Emily. I yeah. just sorry to interrupt. I were at that past that 15 minute mark, and I really appreciate your time and your your mm -hmm. presentation and uh, really interesting topic. I, I do think that you know the idea of contagion will be something that might, will probably provoke some good discussion when we get to the Q and A. Thanks once again for for your Great timing. Thank you, Dr. Jansen. Excellent. Uh, anyway, I'm going to introduce our last uh, presenter today, and uh, the, our last presenter uh, I will welcome is Mr. Chris Pollock. Chris is a registered psychologist who obtained his Master's of Educational Psychology from Massey University in New Zealand. Uh, Chris first registered in Alberta in 2005, and he worked for Alberta Health Services and Rocky View Schools before going into private practice full-time. He's passionate about improving the lives of his clients by giving them practical ways to manage uh, their stress and emotions. Over the years, Chris has worked with school boards and universities across Canada to facilitate research projects and offer high quality training for teachers, psychologists, speech pathologists, and occupational therapists. He also holds a clinical supervisor role with the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary for his continued supervision and mentorship of graduate students in the counseling and for school and applied ch child psychology programs. During his time working with the Calgary and Area Regional Collaborative Service Delivery Group, he began developing development of a suicide ideation assessment protocol for use in schools. This committee developed a document led 
by Alita Ambrose from AHS CAAMP is now used by numerous school boards across Alberta. Welcome, Chris, and I look forward to your, your talk. Thanks, Troy. Um, I'm so glad I put the word ideation in this, or the committee that did this put the word ideation in this um, eight years ago when we started this process. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of that um, and talk there. Uh, email me if you want. I put some links in the chat for you to follow along if you haven't got those in the slides. Um, so I'll do that. So I just need to, to um, reiterate what uh, Troy said there, that I did this work when I was working for Rocky View Schools as the lead psychologist for the fifth public school board in Alberta. Uh, I'm not in that role anymore. I'm in full-time private practice, so I don't speak for Rocky View Schools, uh, but I will talk a lot about those kinds of things. Um, and a special thanks to all of those people, including um, a lot of the people uh, at the various school boards who um, did this work, who I saw in the audience. So we'll we'll move on from there. So I'm going to talk about this suicide, this suicidal ideation response protocol that we developed for schools that's evidence-based. Um, and would have some kind of um, some goals and some some, stru some structure for people to use in those kinds of um, settings. And this is free if you want to take the training. It's online, available through Alberta Health Services um, Mental Health Online Resources for Educators platform, and also the Hope Lab at the uh, U of C, where you can get um, a lot of the material that I'm going to reference here also for free. It's a little freely available. So um, suicide is bad. There's kind of the, the background here, um, leading cause of death. Schools have no flipping clue what to do with a kid who is experiencing suicidal ideation. It raises their blood pressure. It puts their, it, like you can have a kid can say, I'm thinking of killing myself and it will spin the school for days. Um, they need to know how to do things. When I worked at Rocky View, they would call me um, <laughs> hopefully came up with something uh, that worked. The data on the efficacy of supports is limited. Um, School-based sports might work, maybe. Transition plans, not suic no suicide contracts, but transition plans from emergency departments might work as well. Um, and schools, as we would send students to the emergency department who were not need needing this level of intervention. And as you heard from Dr. Joe, um, sending people to a hospital is not effective and may make things worse. Um, when we were developing this, this is what was happening. Um, this is US data, but it was it was mirrored in um, Alberta as well, where the rate of pediatric visits to emergency departments was skyrocketing. Um, and schools were a big cause of that as people started to talk about suicide, thanks to 13 reasons why. Emily, you triggered my PTSD there. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, the other thing that happens is that schools actually cause suicide attempts. Um, most guidance counselors, I know, will tell you that it's math in particular <laughs> that does that, but kids try and kill themselves more often during the school year. Um, and, and as Dr. King was talking about, these people with this highly sensitive nature walking around with these third degree burns when they're in schools, they're just being touched all the time, being stressed out all the time. Um, so we have a huge responsibility to not have this happen and make schools actually safe and caring places there. So we don't want kids to die. That's really, really bad. We have no idea how to assess um, who we should send to the hospital, who we should treat, what kind of treatment. Um, so we wanted to do that. Schools would almost always over respond, uh, liability concerns, things like that. They haven't been trained. The teachers, the principals, the parents have strong emotional reactions. They want to ensure safety. They think that sending something to a hospital, someone to a hospital is a good idea in that respect, that that will increase safety. Uh, they have concerns over liability. Um, they think that sending kids to the hospital is helpful and um, it creates a massive, massive burden on emergency rooms. Um, and in turn, the emergency room takes one look at a kid and says, this kid's not like bleeding out of their eyes. They're not actually dying right now, like go see someone else. Um, and out they go again, they come back to school the next day and they're still suicidal. Um, and they return to the context that caused the suicidal ideation, which often is the school um, in these cases. And there's very limited communication and supports provided to schools from uh, the health system anyway. Um, so that, the, that was the problem that we were trying to solve. 
um, we needed to be accurate. We needed to send people to the right places at the right times, and we still do. We need all of that. We need to not overburden the health system, um, and we need to build a relationship with families and children based on calm and accurate responses. Um, we, we don't want false negatives in this case. We don't want to say, oh, you're fine, and then have someone die, obviously. Um, and, and we want to reduce um, false positives. And um, Lisa Horowitz will, will tell you that. And she had a great paper in 2009 about that. Um, and in these contexts, um, we see emotional reasoning um, in the school setting where they're just trying to dial down their level of emotion by responding rather than actually doing what is useful for the child there. Um, so we wanted a protocol for that. We wanted a process. If anyone's read the checklist manifesto, you'll know how great checklists and processes are at um, increasing the number of lives saved, reducing errors, things like that. We used a multi-stakeholder partnership and development model with a bunch of schools, some suicide experts, health managers from the children's hospital um, and from um, camp. So big shout out to, to camp um, there. And we also got um, youth and families to have kind of input into this process. And we wanted to have an evidence-informed decision-making model um, that reflected values and preferences from youth and families, as well as professional expertise and, and judgment based on research evidence, not just based on my gut, but um, actually on me um, interpreting the evidence correctly or other people interpreting the evidence correctly. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to increase the confidence of people to intervene with students. We wanted people to be more prepared to do that. We wanted a standard response when people responded to students. Um, we wanted to know who should get in this lane and who shouldn't get in this lane. Uh, so in a school setting, if you have a mental health professional, then they're the person doing this assessment, not some random person. Um, and if you don't have that person, then that's where you will step out of the protocol and pass that person on to an appropriate mental health professional rather than sending them to the emergency room. Um, in those kinds of ways. We wanted to increase the, the quality of communication at school between staff, as well as with um, the health system. Um, and we wanted to give people an ability to talk with parents about, hey, your child has expressed that they want to kill themselves, um, and this is what we're gonna do about it, and this is how we're gonna have this conversation while everyone has the strong emotional reactions. We wanted accurate referral pathways for students, um, and we wanted people to be calm. Um, adding emotion to uh, students who are suicidal is in no way helpful. And so we need to model a calm and measured response there. Um, and then we needed to know what to do when these kids came back to school. Um, we would sign no suicide contracts with them. Um, and you know we've known for years that that isn't actually that useful. So we made a protocol. Um, and this is a section of that. There are parts one to four, depending on your role. So this is the first response. A kid says to a teacher, I'm thinking of killing myself, or a friend comes up and says, hey, Susie just said they're thinking of, of like going in the bathroom and hanging themselves. Those things happen. So we need to immediately respond to ensure safety. We need to determine the urgency of that. Uh, not in a high, medium, low way. Um, we need to assess their level of suicidal ideation, and then we need to decide what to do about that. And then when that child does come back to school, if we send them off, um, what we would do about that. Um, so we, as a group through the um, Regional Library for um, Service Delivery, which has been collapsed now, uh, built uh, a free online training for school staff um, including administrators, teachers, assistants, point people who would be people who would be assigned to have these kids in the building if there wasn't a mental health professional. Um, and then we, again, built an additional training around online assessment of suicide risk, which I'll also talk about. So we had developed all of this for face-to-face. -face. COVID happens, pivot, do online things, figure out how to do that, what works well, um, and see what happens there. So that's there. We um, assess that we did some some studies of the protocol. I, I see um, Dr. Schwartz in the in the crowd here. He was one of the researchers that kind of supported that. Um, it, in general, staff who completed the training had more positive opinions than, than those who did not. And it was interesting to see um, 
Dr. Job talk about role playing. We used a lot of role playing. It was really interesting when we said, okay, now you're a teacher, I'm a student. I've just said that I'm thinking of going home and killing myself. What do you say to me? And they would not, they would not ask, are you thinking of killing yourself? They tried 5,000 different ways to, to ask something else, right? And role playing really helped them get used to that. And they realized that the whole world doesn't crash down around them when you say the word suicide or, or killing yourself. And that does not actually make a child more likely to kill themselves. Um, so here's some stats that just says like, this was a good thing. Um, then um, the benefits experience with the protocol seemed really, really helpful. Uh, it was a step-by-step -step standardized guide. Um, and it helped people manage their own emotional responses and let them um, respond appropriately to the situation. Their uh, consistent framework, this is a positive quote. Um, I'll skip it, so hopefully we can finish early. Um, there were some barriers. It's massive. Um, the protocol, it is very, very long. Um, we did build a shorter version for reassessments as well um, based on that feedback, but we wanted to be thorough um, here. Um, and there's kind of a, a perception that doing a protocol is hard, but I think as we've seen through the, the talks today, um, that once you get used to it, it's, it's a really good tool there. Um, and interesting to see this comment here that use of the protocol may make it harder to build rapport with a student um, that came up in, in one of the other speakers as well. And, and it does until you're used to it. And then you're not like reading from your screen or reading from the piece of paper and it becomes much more natural after that was, was what we kind of, found there, um, but that it let people, teachers go home and sleep at night, knowing that they'd done the right thing, even when it wasn't sending a student to the hospital, um, that they felt very, very comfortable that they had kind of like left no stones unturned and moved those kids into the appropriate treatment pathway there. Then during COVID, we had to figure out how to do that online assessment. Um, and so on the Hope Lab website, which you have, you can find the research studies or these lovely infographics um, that were made about how to do that work. And I think one of the, the key things that um, I'll mention, which um, I discovered while sitting in the click and click line at some um, superstore, is when you connect your phone to the Bluetooth of your car and you call and you say, hey, I'm here to pick up my groceries. Absolutely everybody outside your vehicle can hear that. And you would have people in their vehicles, either kids or parents, um, having conversations with us about suicide assessments uh, because they wanted to be alone or they didn't want to hide in the closet because their mom was listening and things like that. And they were using Bluetooth and we had to get them to turn it off and use earphones um, and things like that. So there are a few little things there um, to just do that. So I recommend going and looking at those and seeing that. Um, so standardized protocols, good. It's used in the vast majority of schools in Alberta now. Um, Edmonton Public, Calgary Catholic, not, not Calgary Public yet, um, and a bunch, Rocky View, a bunch of other ones. Um, you can do this online as well. There's some pretty solid research for that now. Um, and as a psychologist, just knowing about this um, is enough for you to um, support kids who you are working with who may be experiencing suicidal ideation. There's a bunch of references. Email me if you need anything. I'm finished early. Thank you for your time. Well, excellent. Thank you, uh, Chris, for that that presentation. And uh, you know, definitely uh, want to thank all of our panelists today in terms of uh, the different topics today, whether it ranged from uh, you know the standard practices that psychologists are using for assessment. Uh, issues around contagion and, and influence of media, uh, the, the use of DBT in, in, in therapy and, and some of the training kind of priorities and or uh, how we should be looking at suicide within the school setting. I think these are all very important topics. So we're gonna turn now to our question and answer time and how it's going to work is I'll, I'll raise a question and I'll identify a speaker. Everyone can, of our panelists can have their cameras active. I'll just, once I identify you, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and make sure that you can answer the question. So our first question of the day will be directed to um, 
to our first presenter. So this one's for you, Jonathan. Uh, and the, the question uh, is, can you speak to the potential differences of in-person graduate school training versus virtual online training pertaining to the level of perceived value in suicide risk training received? Uh, and see if you can answer that. Yeah, it is it is a great question. I think um, well, the hindsight on any project is always just aggressively 2020. And one of the few demographics I didn't collect is uh, what modality did they conduct or did they complete their uh, graduate training? I asked like when, uh, how long, what degree, um, the like where they're practicing, how they got to this practice. Well, one I didn't ask was the difference between online and uh, in-person training. I I'll be I'll be cautious. I don't think there's evidence uh, to say one is intrinsically better than the other. I think we could probably assume that we are we could be well trained in both as long as it meets those same criteria that um, like the uh, like Dr. Kramer's core competency model mentions around uh, you know, it being experiential and practicable. Um, the only thing I can think of is uh, I've noticed in the last year, uh, some programs have uh, radically shifted the way that they've been doing their own suicide risk assessment training. Uh, I have to shout out Grant McEwen. I did a talk there and half my slides were worthless because they had already learned them in a different course, a whole course. And that was already like guest lecturing for a different, it was, it was fantastic. Um, so short answer, I don't have an answer, uh, but great question. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jonathan. The next question I'm going to address to uh, Dr. King. Uh, a lot of individuals uh, were were asking the question about where can we find good DBT training uh, for ourselves, and if you had any suggestions, do you have any on uh, prepared for that? Absolutely. I'm so glad that that was a common question. Um, so PsychWire uh, is an, it's associated with Behavior Tech, which is the company that Marsha Linehan uh, owns. And they have very, very comprehensive training. And it's, as I mentioned, it's also training that can include a, a consultation piece. So it's not just the didactic, though there's really great training videos, a lot of good information but also that you can do some active uh, work with a, a DBT expert. So I would check out PsychWire. Um, it's also online, so it makes it pretty accessible. You don't have to travel with your team somewhere. You can all kind of uh, access it remotely if need be. Excellent. And just as a little follow up to the, uh, um, just to keep it with you for a second longer, Rachel, is, uh, is where do if the Grey Nuns program isn't offering that that fantastic program currently? Do you know where there's where we where people are sending individuals? Is it is it mainly just private individuals that have DBT training now? Like what what's the general suggestion for us as psychologists in terms of referrals? Yeah. Um... Well, you know, I know, as I said, the Royal Alec program is still open. Uh, I, I do hear, I don't want to talk out of school, but I do hear there's some risk to that program as well. Um, but uh, that's open in Edmonton, the Sheldon Schumer in Calgary. Um, and then, like I said, there's some private practice. So my practice has a comprehensive DBT program. I think there's one at ECSS. I think that's the name of the, of the practice in Edmonton as well. And there's a couple really great private practice options in, in Calgary, but there's certainly not enough availability of, of public uh, treatment, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for that. I mean, obviously the, you know, there's, there's the usual suspects of places where they could look like PAs referral line, uh, the site today where people will advertise if they have some of the specific training. So those would be, maybe some other useful ways to figure out who you could send to that might have specific training in this regard. I'll now turn the question to uh, Emily. Emily, uh, some were, were curious and in, in, uh, as you presented about that 13 reasons why, mm -hmm. and, and some of their question was sort of with an eye, they said that the original thrust for the creators of that they said was to raise awareness around sexual assault, suicide, and accessing resources. And they thought it was a positive focus. And, and maybe if you could comment on why you think it may be backfired, given that there's a lot of data on that there may have been some negative contagion kind of results from that. You know, that is a, a wonderful question. And it, it is unfortunately fairly uh, involved, I will say. Um, there is a timeline and an outline of, of things that Netflix and the creators of the show did um, in order to try to create 
create um, this sense that, yes, like we're doing it um, for the reasons of providing awareness and for advocating for positive conversations. However, there was a clear neglect of actually trying to follow recommendations. Uh, one thing I will say, and, and this is something that I um, kind of cover as I talk about um, the whole process in the review paper I mentioned, but unfortunately there were instances where individuals in the mental health field were contacted by Netflix to review this show before it was even released. And they said, this is a problem. You need to fix some of the things that are going on here. And they did not actually do that. Um, there was also instances where thereafter, when, when some of these concerns were being raised, when some of the research started to come out about the show that Netflix then had to try to backpedal and, and create um, kind of safeguards either for themselves or, or for um, parents or for you know, school systems in order to try to mitigate these negative effects. So for example, they created a 30 minute special called Beyond the Reasons to try to talk about their intentions, um, which was unfortunately not effective. They also put trigger warnings on retroactively, which do not um, also show effectiveness in the research, sadly. Um, and then again, you know, years after the release of the first season in 2019, um, because of all the research that had come out about the show, they had to retroactively remove the scene where um, this young woman actually takes her own life and her mother finds her, um, which, you know, in hindsight is perhaps helpful, but, you know, also creates this sense of um, mystery kind of around the, the original version of the show for teens. Um, and it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. So, so I would say that, that yes, you know, perhaps the intentions were there, but we have really no way of knowing exactly um, what processes they went through um, other than what they're sharing with us. Um, but ultimately uh, there were definitely some, some missteps. Thank you for that answer. That really helps a lot to think about that. And I think there's a lot of unanswered questions around uh, those kinds of issues. And so, you know, a lot of we're asking, how do we get a hold of your research when it's done? Uh, so, yes. you know, might might you know, let's encourage you to publish that so that we can, for so we sure. can see. Yeah. yeah. I, I know great. I didn't mention it. Uh, I didn't put it on my slides, unfortunately, but I will in the chat put my email as well uh, through the U of A. And if you if you, uh, you can also find me, I'm sure, on the internet uh, through the U of A website. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Chris, I'm gonna direct the next question for you. Uh, there was a couple questions that sort of were directed specifically to you. One was uh, someone asking you to comment on assist training, which I'm not familiar with as much, if you're, and maybe can, you can do that. And another asked about, uh, to ask you to comment more about the implications of the risk of protocol negatively affecting rapport, if you could kind of expand on that point. Yeah, so assist training, um, we looked at it, a lot of school boards use it. It's a um, pretty solid training from the Center for Suicide Prevention. I'm just looking, waiting for see, to see Jonathan nodding there. So yeah, uh, it's long, it's two days out of school, which is, um, hard for, for people to, to spend that long out. There are other uh, trainings that are um, have been shown to be equally as effective um, about that. And I think um, one of the real benefits of that training is that it does contain role plays about asking about whether you're going to kill yourself or not, which is for me, some of the real value there. Back to the rapport question. Um, most of the time, like in a school, we're spending a lot of time trying to build relationships with students. So typically we have something to go on already. Um, there are a number of uh, students who, if they come in, it's like, hey, so like, you know, how's your suicidal ideation today on a one to 10 scale? They'll be like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about the crisis of the week. Um, so there are a number of people that will not seek people who are going to ask about that. And there's a there's a harm reduction approach, I think, that we typically use in those situations where seeing the guidance counselor is better than not seeing the guidance counselor and having a positive, kind experience with someone is valuable, as we see from the, the kind of notes that were sent, right? That those kind of just having people who are nice to you is generally helpful. Uh, so we'll do that. Um, there are times when we would worry a lot about those things um, 
but that in the end, once people got used to the protocol, it's kind of like I, I do a lot of ADOS assessments as well, and you can kind of do it without the book. Um, and you can follow the protocol without reading from the script as well. Um, so yeah, no, I think I don't, we don't see any particular um, impact on rapport and, and negative impacts in that way. Excellent, thanks for that clarification. So my next question, I'll, I'll start with you again, Jonathan, and go back to you on this, but I might open this up to all of you because it might have relevance for all of you uh, in different ways. But a couple of people have asked, how we should be considering things like religion, uh, culture, those sorts of variables. And, and one of the particular stats that did jump out at me on your study, Jonathan, was that 99% never even ask about it. Uh, and so I wonder if you just kind of comment on that and to, you know, talk about what you think is the proper place of that uh, based on what you've learned. And then we can maybe see if the other panels have opinions on this as well. Oh yeah, love to talk about this. Um, the so I'll, I'll I'll lead with having you potentially introspect a little bit about the nature of suicidality. That it is about your own self death, and I might be extending myself a little bit, but I'm prepared to uh, back the idea that death is steeped in culture and spirituality. It perhaps is one of the most culturally and spiritual elements of our existence. Um, and when death is being brought up in the clinical setting between practitioners, I think it's paramount that we understand how they interpret death in a culture and spiritual lens in order to get a perspective on what it means for them to say, then I want to die by suicide. Because that can mean something very different for someone who's, uh, whose religion is particularly like against uh, suicide compared to one that it's it's more... I, I, maybe not as explicit. The long and short in terms of resources that I can recommend is uh, Dr. Joyce's Choose, uh, you know, I'm just going to link it here. It's the cultural assessment for risk of risk for suicide. Uh, they've been doing this work for a, at least this was published in 2013, but for a long time. And they start with pretty much the same claim that I was making of like, we're not doing this element of risk assessment in our risk assessments. And there are many reasons why we should. Um, they specifically have a scalar measure called the CARS, the Culture Assessment Risk for Suicide. Um, I've used it before, it's fantastic. Depending on its integration with CAMS, uh, I've sometimes included in like the SSF. Um, I'd, I'd recommend that as your first foray into trying to integrate that into your practice. Excellent. And thank you, by the way, for posting the link right away into the chat. So all participants, it's in the chat. If you click the chat button, you'll see that Jonathan did post a, a link to that article. Do any of the other panelists wish to weigh in on that issue or that topic? No? Well, one thing um, I'll, I'll just say very quickly is, is, you know, I agree with everything that John is saying, as usual. But uh, <laughs> I, I'll also say that, that, yeah, absolutely. I think that there is very important issues to be considered in terms of culture and religion or spiritual spirituality in general. Um, even as I was talking about this idea of acceptability of suicide given cultural context, um, it's, you know, pervasive and even, you know, again, this is, this is showing that, you know, I've been doing a lot of studying because of my candidacy exam, but even in, you know, Greek, uh, Greek mythology and in um, medieval times, there is this certain like collective sense that suicide is acceptable in su certain situations or, or you know, again, in the instance of other cultures, such as in Japan, mm -hmm. there is kind of just an, a natural increase in acceptability for suicide. Um, and, and if we ignore these things, if we just see it as a cultural or a spiritual, um, we are not benefiting um, our clients. Um, and, and, and yeah, these are things that we really do need to consider. Yeah, to me, it might be very helpful then to have sort of some resources and some maybe some various cultural or religious points of view or differences. And, you know, so for our, for our training as psychologists, so we could understand this, I mean, it's helpful to have useful tools for this, but uh, also to understand the, the various differences and challenges, uh, having worked in Indigenous uh, cultures on occasion, there's a particular, um, you know, understanding about what what uh, death means, of, as well as suicide, potentially, and I've been taught different things, and depending on what context, and so 
I think it was real important for our own learning and training. So thank you for those comments. Uh, the next question uh, I, I wanted to ask all of the panelists, but maybe we'll start with you, Dr. King, is what is, the in your mind, the highest priority for us as Alberta psychologists in terms of addressing uh, both the training related issues as well as the service related issues in, in either treating or preventing suicide? It's a big question, but I thought I would put this to you and, and ask each of the panelists this question. And this might be the way we wrap up today. We'll see how much time we have. Start with Dr. King. Thanks so much uh, for that question, Troy. Because I, I mean, I think you, we do have to be thoughtful about where we, where we place our focus. To my mind, there's been a lot of work on advocacy around awareness of suicide, which I think is great. And at the same time, I do think we really need to be talking about how, how do we actually provide treatment? You know, like I, like I talked about, we have treatments that work, we have treatments that are effective and people can't get access to them. So we need to be talking about how do we um, implement in public public health settings um, and, and private practice settings, uh, these treatments that are developed, that are effective. Um, and so a big piece of that is, is training and supervision um, so that clinicians can have the skills because we don't, as I mentioned, just wanna be keeping people alive um, and only intervening at the point of crisis. We actually really want to be solving those underlying problems so that, that folks can have that life worth living. Thank you for that answer. So I'll turn it to next to Chris, if you don't mind, if you're ready to answer this, and maybe with a particular focus in schools, uh, since that is a, a place where you've done a lot of work, what you've done, and you've been looking at the topic in a few schools, but what's the big priority there for next? So like, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll expand your meaning of schools to include yeah. higher education. Um, I think that um, we, we have been remiss as psychologists to not be studying this in Alberta um, at all. And, and I think outside of, of Jonathan really and um, Derek Truscott, who occasionally writes an article about something that will absolutely blow your mind. Um, and then Diana Exner at um, UFC, really, there aren't tons of people doing this work and we need people to, to have this as a research focus and then be able to teach psychologists in, in who in their training to do that in the schools I think like we need a cultural shift um, there in terms of knowing what um, someone's saying is if a, if a student says I'm so stupid I should kill myself because they you know like wrote the wrong spelling um, we need to not worry very much about that. We need to quickly see what that was and then move on with our day. And then when children literally come into us bleeding from the wrists, um, that we would respond very calmly and appropriately in that way. So, you know, my protocol, or not my protocol, but the protocol is the answer to all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Very, very helpful. Uh, Emily, I'll let you go next if that's okay. Jonathan, we'll save you for your last there. But in, maybe in your answer, if you wouldn't mind, maybe for thinking particularly about your topic, uh, if you'll comment on that, answer that question in relation to media, but also maybe like I'm thinking about mediating factors mm -hmm. like parents, uh, training on critical thinking for youth. Um, like what are your thoughts over what's the biggest priority in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a really great question. And I and I think that um, awareness is a huge piece and and specifically for for youth. Of course, um, we know that the most impactful environment for children and for youth is is home, um, whether they want to admit that or not <laughs> at times. Um, but I think that uh, creating a culture where it's okay to talk about suicide and it's okay to talk about those difficult emotions. And I, and I think that, that it even kind of bleeds into issues around um, stigma around mental health and, and even uh, things like such as toxic masculinity and, and um, socializing of, of, of kids and, and what is okay and not okay to talk about. And, and like, to be honest, I'll, I think that, the purpose behind things like 13 reasons or around um, other 
things that are trying to engage youth, like the, the popularity of this show and of other, you know, phenomena that become popular around mental health and suicide with youth show us that they are interested in having these conversations and it show us that they are interested in in that kind of exercise and, and discussion around mental health and, and suicide. So we need to be the ones to be able to provide them with with actual sound and uh, mindful information and open conversations that are healthy. Um, and so I think that that's you know a call for us as psychologists to um, facilitate those conversations in in our communities, in the schools that we work at, um, in our private practices, or or just kind of wherever your um, scope of influence is, and and also to encourage parents to educate themselves about what you know positive conversations around mental health look like, what positive conversations around suicide look like, um, and and that's. Again, like one of the main purposes in, in around my study and what I'm hoping to do um, is to get those supportive adults involved because they are so critical for, for youth development. Excellent, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate your perspective on that. And Jonathan, I'm gonna give you the last word on this and we'll probably have to wrap up after you give an an this answer. And of course your focus has really been on the, on the training sort of side of things and I've already heard you say, you know, we just need to make sure we front end load that training more more deliberately. But maybe, you know, what's the what's the priority? Knowing that answer already, but what's the next priority then in your mind for making sure that we are doing an adequate job? Absolutely. So, psychologist wise, it's the stuff I mentioned in the presentation of um, do that training earlier in our graduate studies. If you're an instructor, there we have good models that you can base uh, your syllabus on. Um, I think more broadly, uh, peer support has demonstrated some very good uh, efficacy in terms of uh, helping generalize to the folks who are experiencing suicidal ideation, which Dr. Jobs has mentioned is most people uh, compared to those who are uh, attempting or those who um, are close to, to dying by suicide. So two things I'd recommend uh, we play a, a more active role, like what Dr. King mentioned in terms of that social advocacy, that social justice, I think through that peer support lived experience lens. Uh, and if so, on, that's on the bottom side. And then on the top side, um, our hospitals need to be better at this. Uh, if I can consider hospitalization, and it's not going to cause harm, uh, I mean, this sounds trite, but that would help a lot. And I think psychology has a role to play in that one that I don't know if we're as involved as we could be. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, to all the panelists. Uh, you know, I, as we've been talking in the chat room, there's been so many gracious people who've been posting uh, helpful tips on where to find DVD training places and or, or facilities you can refer clients to. Other resources have been posted there. You know, and we've, we've really appreciated all the panelists' perspectives and ability to kind of give us uh, a look at this. My own take on this and my own little uh, thought about this is that suicide is a thing that can impact all of us in a both personal and a professional way in, in various ways. And that we, uh, we want to encourage all our members to be able to take appropriate self-care in, in relation to that. And because it is a difficult thing if you've experienced loss of, of someone in your life or of a, of a client or a patient, which can happen, that it's important that we also support one another as professionals and be prepared to, to seek out supports on that, uh, you know, so that we understand that. I, I think that for all of us, you know, my own thinking has really been transformed through the, pro the process of these workshops, uh, the panelists and the, and the uh, keynote speaker both in terms of really challenging some long held views and beliefs about this. And I think it's really eye opening experience. So I hope everyone takes that away uh, today. Uh, at the end of today's event, everyone will be getting a certificate of registration. We're in our continuing competence uh, era. And so you can get that at the end of today, uh, as well as a link for an online evaluation survey. We always value everyone's feedback. So we really appreciate you filling that out. Um, and you know, you, you also may go back to the main page and access our survey there right away if you want to do that. I'll ask Nina to share on the screen uh, a little thing on the suicide prevention slide that we just had prepared for today. I think this is in the in light of the idea that you know it's good to know where some of those resources exist, both for self, for professionals, and for clients alike. These are only a sampling, of course. There's certainly a lot of the of 
of available resources. Uh, and on a final note, uh, you know, I just wanted to reinforce the idea that uh, this is an important topic. You know, if we can understand better how or prepare or train better and how to um, treat and, and prevent suicides, we're all better off for it. And, and so I definitely think that this is well worthwhile that we could engage in these. And it certainly it fulfills our college mandate of that public protection piece by, by, by working to understand the topic that's so important. Um, I also wanted to just uh, let you know that there's lots of resources on our CAP website. Uh, there's nothing too specific to this, although there has been an entire CAP monitor article already dedicated to the topic of suicide prevention. I would encourage your members to take a look at those articles if you haven't. Uh, there's certainly we could keep updating those and my hope is that, that this is that there could be good fodder for another issue at some point uh, on this top important topic uh, based on some of what you guys presented uh, today and maybe we can even twist your arm into thinking about doing something like that in the near future. Uh, we're going to encourage you to visit uh, all people to visit the YouTube channel and you can always rewatch today's presentation. So some of you said, hey, you went so fast, I didn't get to read that. Uh, you'll get a full opportunity. You can listen to it again, and we definitely welcome that. We've been trying to make sure we make this more, more accessible and easily accessible for your own learning and development. So take advantage of that. Um, and uh, Nina, you, if you wanted to share the contact us slide for you know for a couple minutes, and then if there's any specific questions that people have about today's presentations, I know we didn't get to everyone's questions. I apologize for that. It's, it's always difficult to get through every question. Um, you know, we do keep track of those and we always try to see about ways we can address that either through publications like the CAP monitor, so, so stay tuned. Um, if anyone has co college related questions around registration or licensing and things like that, just call us at our office. We, we definitely want to, um, you know, be responsive to answering those kinds of questions. Uh, there's lots of information on our newly developed website if you haven't taken advantage of that. Um, and that's all I have to say for today. I want to again thank all our panelists for all the time and effort and presentations today. I uh, thank everyone for participating and uh, I wish you a, a happy weekend. Uh, it's a nice day outside to so go enjoy a uh, barbecue and some time with family and friends. Uh, and I wish you well. <laughs>